the 10th anniversary commemoration of Kojoba Redu, and it's been uh, marked with a, a lecture on protecting the public pairs that's going on at the Kofi Annan India ICT Center here in Accra. We'll be going there to you. Uh, we understand that Professor H. Kwesi Pempe is speaking now. Why don't we go over there? Because he really was an exceptional public servant. And I think I'm really glad that some organization that found, has found it worth the while to actually institute these memorial lectures um, in his name and in his honor. And I, I commend you for that. Um, I also, of course, know the, the, the chairperson for uh, today's occasion, uh, but I know him, like most of you, primarily by reputation. Uh, he has managed to capture the imagination of many Ghanaians, uh, and it, I think, testifies to the thirst for a certain quality of public service. The fact that we have a commemoration for Barry Edu, as well as the kind of sentiment that I feel uh, expressed towards uh, the current Auditor General really testifies to the fact that there is indeed a shortage of such talent in our, our, our current environment and there is a public yearning for a certain quality of public service and of a public servant. And I think he definitely epitomizes that. Um, like uh, uh, George said, the full resume of the Auditor General Daniel Yao Domlevo is definitely uh, before you. So I will not take too much of your time, but I would invite you to actually read it. Uh, he's, of course, um, a, a, a professional chartered accountant, uh, as one ought to be to become an Auditor General. But he has an extensive, he comes to the job with extensive experience, not just locally but internationally, uh, including with reputable multilateral organizations. And um, I remember that when uh, uh, his appointment was announced, you know, it was in a certain cloud, it was caught in a certain cloud of controversy because it was one of these transitional type of announcements. And, but everybody that I spoke to around that time who did not like the idea of these last minute appointments made an exception somewhat for this gentleman. I did not know him, but I, I spoke to quite a few people who said, well, I understand that the Auditor General guy is very good. You know, so, and he has actually lived up to the reputation. Uh, since his appointment, uh, he has taken a number of uh, bold steps and bold initiatives that I think um, uh, should augur well for public, uh, the management of public finances in our country if we take it seriously. Uh, I will not uh, go on further. I'll just invite you to really uh, take a look at his, his life of accomplishment. But for now, I'll just invite him uh, to uh, the podium to give us the wisdom that is the reason why we are here today. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Daniel Yao Domlevo. Thank you for those kind words, Prof. The Chairman, Professor Kwesi Prempe, Dr. Robe, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to turn, uh, join me to thank Dr. Brobe, the Chief Policy Analyst, Ghana Institute for Policy, Public Policy Options, GIPO, and other organizers of this lecture on management and accounting for Ghana's public finance dedicated to the life and work of the Honorable Kwejo Bauredu, a chartered accountant and a politician who died in office while serving our beloved country as the Minister of Finance and Economic Planning under His Excellency President John Ajekum Kufo. I thank them not only for the honor done me by inviting me to this August annual lecture, but also for the privilege
to deliver the lecture for this year, which is also marking the 10th anniversary of his demise. demise. I must confess that I would have preferred listening to the Honorable Kajuba Uredu deliver this lecture on protecting the public purse, keeping the gate shut before the horse bolts instead. But God knows best. May his gentle soul continue to rest in peace. Amen. Amen. I knew Honorable Bauredu in professional circles, but from a long distance. And these were, these were years before he became a politician or a minister. Those who know me will know that I was born in a small village in Afram Place. It is called Adiamra. It's just about a kilometer and a half or two kilometers away from Donkokro. And I used to go there very often. So on one of my visits going to see my parents, I ran into Honorable Kwaju Bauredu at the river called Kwau Adoso. And since he was not familiar with the place, he didn't know the protocols of going on the ferry. So when the time came for us to go on the ferry, his driver couldn't get space on the ferry. So he was left behind. I recognized him, so I came down from the ferry so that I'll make way for him to go. But the next driver will not agree. He said, if you are not going, then I should go, not him. And I was trying to find my way for him. So he called me near him and said, my brother, allow them. So they went. And we spent more than three hours together. And that is where we started talking about several issues. And from that day, he always called me my village brother. He never called me by name. I really admired his humility. But the one thing about him which I wish God gave me was the retentive memory that he had. He could be talking to you and refer to a page in his budget statement, a page in daily graphic, a page in Hamza Wu. And I started learning some of those things. So if my staff are surprised the rate at which I quote the Constitution, it is from this great man. <laughs> Today's topic, protecting the public purse, keeping the gate shut before the horse bolts, calls for being proactive in ensuring that we stop the leakages of public funds and not only rely on corrective measures, which some may say closing the gate after the horse has bolted. In fact, if there is one institution that all over the world is accused of closing the gate after the horse has bolted, it is the Supreme Auditors or the Auditors General. Chasing or running after the horse has been the traditional preoccupation of the Auditor General and hence the constitutional mandate under Article 187 of the Constitution, which provides that within six months after the financial year, the Auditor General shall submit his report to Parliament. In other words, tell Ghanaians of the various gates, that is, ministry, departments, agencies, through which the horses voted. So you tell this one, stole this one, this one he passed here, this one jumped through here, and is gone. That's what we are expected to be doing. In my humble opinion, I can, we can ensure that the public funds are safe only when we have an effective and efficient public financial management system in place. The effectiveness and efficiency of public financial management systems are not logical outcomes of pouring the most expensive or procuring the most expensive IT infrastructure. Else, Ghana will have had one of the best PFM systems in the world. In fact, on the, in the international circles, whenever they are referring to expensive PFM systems, Ghana usually come on top. So Ghana has spent more than $100 million, and they can still find 
their PFM system working. One cannot achieve effectiveness and efficiency simply by organizing workshops, trainings, and visits abroad. The most important ingredient, in my opinion, which is lacking in Ghana and most countries in the region is discipline. Without an effective and efficient PFM system, the horse will never be found in the stable to always boot. Mr. Chairman, an effective and efficient public financial management should have at least four outcomes. Those who have been following PIFA, Public Expenditure and Financial Accountability Framework, which is propagated by World Bank and IMF, there are three. But some of us are forcefully fighting for the fourth one, and I'll come to it, and you'll get to know why. According to PIFA or IMF World Bank Financial Management Framework, a good financial management system should result in aggregate fiscal discipline. We must cut our coat according to our size said that we don't leave debt for generations yet unborn. So government must live within a certain limit, fiscally responsible. A second requirement is strategic allocation of resources. We cannot just use our money, but we must use the money to develop the country. So if we say we want good roads, can we say that the budget is speaking to that? If we, want, we say we want quality education, is our budget speaking to that? Because the budget is the tool for resource allocation. So there must be strategic allocation of resources. The third one, for which public service actually exists, is that the public financial management should lead to efficient service delivery. If you are putting more money into health, when you go to the hospital, you get the services that is supposed to be rendered or we put more money into education, but when you go, the teachers are busy doing something else. So these are the three outcomes expected of public financial management system. But some of us have added a fourth leg, which is eradicating corruption or minimizing corruption. You can't say I have a good public financial management system, but people are stealing the money. We find it unacceptable where there is so much abuses in the system. Meanwhile, we say we have a good, a robust public financial management system. And I may be visiting these four topics or outcomes in my speech from time to time, but I'll be dwelling on the fourth one, which is eradicating corruption most of the time. In fact, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> Eradicating corruption sounds to be something which is perfect and unattainable. So I was very reluctant using the phrase, even though it is in our constitution. So I started searching the meaning for the word eradicating corruption. What I found even disturbed me more. First, I saw to destroy cor corruption completely. And I said, in Ghana here, it will work. Put an end to corruption, I said the same thing. Then I got to get rid of corruption. I moved on, I saw eliminate corruption. Do away with corruption. I was getting worried, I said, these meanings, I don't think they are attainable. But I saw another one who says, suppress corruption. I said, that is what Ghana can do. <laughs> So, so I, don't, I think that's where we are going towards. We want to reduce it a bit, but eradicating it, <laughs> I don't know if we can do it. And so I term it a future impossible test. It's not going to happen because we are told corruption has been with us since Adam. And today corruption is really, I think, the widest religion in the world. It cuts across all religions, all tribes, all nationalities, Racist, etc. I don't think there is any religion as big as corruption. And it doesn't have anything to do with the type of country you are in. Be it a developed or developing country, there is corruption everywhere. Mr. Chairman, please.
permit me to honor the memory of the late Kojo Banredu by visiting paragraph three of the concept note shared with me by Dr. Brobe, which states that the Honorable Kojo Banredu's tenor as the finance and economic minister was anchored on two irremovable pillars, namely, the public finances of Ghana must be managed and accounted for as prescribed by the Constitution of Ghana. That was the first pillar. Two, that public service is an honor and recognition which was to be reciprocated through excellence in performance and humility at all times. So if you find yourself in public service, you have been done an honor. And you should reciprocate it by rendering service. That is his position. I will go first on the first pillar, which is public finance of Ghana must be managed and accounted for as prescribed by the constitution of Ghana. And that takes my mind straight to the directive principles of state policy. Mr. Chairman, since of the constitution contains the directive principles of state policy, which according to Article 34, shall guide all citizens, parliament, the president, the judiciary, the council of state, the cabinet, the political parties, the, and other bodies and persons in applying or interpreting the constitution and any other law, and in taking and implementing any policy decisions for the establishment of a just and free society in the country. So directive principles of state policy binds everybody, for be you a president, a judge, etc. The constitution says you must abide by the directive principles of state policy. So no Ghanaian is above that directive. Now, it provides that the state shall take appropriate measures to make democracy a reality by decentralizing the administrative and financial machinery of government to the regions and districts. I would like to take this one again. The Constitution says, the state shall take appropriate measures to make democracy a reality by decentralizing the administrative and financial machinery of government to the regions and the districts, and also to take steps to eradicate corrupt practices and abuse of power. 